Salutations, fine people, and welcome to the video lessons for Chapter 7 of the Foundations of Scalable Systems. In this series of three videos, I'm going to cover asynchronous messaging-based systems, starting in this lesson with an overview of the anatomy of a messaging-based application. Communications is fundamental to distributed systems, and it's a major issue that architects need to incorporate into their systems designs. So far in these video lessons, the discussions have assumed synchronous messaging. A client sends a response sends a request and waits for a server to respond. This is how most distributed communications are designed to occur, as the client requires an instantaneous response to proceed. However, not all systems have this requirement. For example, when I return some goods that I purchased online, my shorts don't fit for example, I take them to my local UPS or FedEx store. They scan my QR code and I give them the package to process. I don't then wait in the store for confirmation that the product has been successfully received by the vendor and my payment returned. That would be rather dull and somewhat unproductive. I trust the shipping service to deliver my unwanted goods to the vendor and expect to get a message a few days later when it has been processed. We can design our distributed systems to emulate this behavior. Using an asynchronous communication style, clients known as producers send their requests to an intermediary messaging service. This acts as a delivery mechanism to relay the request to the intended destination, known as the consumer for processing. Producers fire and forget the requests they send. Asynchronous messaging platforms are a mature area of technology with multiple products in the space. The venerable IBM MQ series appeared in 1993 and it's still a mainstay of enterprise systems. The Java messaging service and an API level specification is supported by multiple JEE vendor implementations. RabbitMQ, which shall use as an illustration later in this lessons for this chapter, is arguably the most widely deployed open source messaging system. In the messaging world, you'll never be short of choice. Conceptually, a messaging system comprises the elements shown here on the slide. Message queues store a sequence of messages. Producers send messages to queues. Consumers retrieve messages from queues. And a message broker manages one or more queues. So a message broker is a service that manages one or more queues. When messages are sent from producers to the queue, the broker adds messages to the queue in the order they arrive, basically a FIFO approach. The broker is responsible for efficiently managing message receipts and retention until one or more consumers retrieves the message, messages which are then removed from the queue. Message brokers that manage many queues and many requests can effectively utilize many CPUs and lots of memory to provide very low latency accesses. Many consumers can take messages from the same queue. Each message is retrieved by exactly one consumer. And there are basically two modes of behavior for consumers to retrieve messages, known as pull or push, as illustrated on the slide. While the exact mechanisms are product specific, the basic semantics are common across technologies. In pull mode, also known as polling, consumers send a request to the broker, which responds with the next message available for processing. If there are no messages available, the consumer must poll the queue until messages arrive. In push mode, a consumer informs the broker that it wishes to receive messages from a queue. The consumer provides a callback function that should be invoked when a message is available. The consumer then blocks or does other work, and the message broker delivers messages to the callback function for processing when they're available. Generally, utilizing the push mode when available is much more efficient and recommended. It avoids the broker being potentially swamped by requests from multiple consumers and makes it possible to implement message delivery more efficiently in the broker. Consumers also need to acknowledge message receipts because upon consumer acknowledgement, the broker is free to mark a message as delivered and remove it from the queue. There's two modes for acknowledgement, either automatic or manual. If we use automatic acknowledgement, messages are acknowledged as soon as they are delivered to the consumer and before they're processed. This provides the lowest latency message delivery as the acknowledgement can be sent back to the broker before the message is processed. 
This is illustrated on the slide here, whereby a message is delivered to the consumer. It is acknowledged. Once acknowledged, it can be removed from the queue. And then eventually the consumer processes the message. This is all well and good, but what happens if the consumer crashes before the message is fully processed? Of course, if a consumer crashes before fully processing a message, then we risk losing the message content and its associated processing. For this reason, often a consumer will want to ensure a message is fully processed before acknowledging it. In this case, it will utilize manual acknowledgements. This guards against this possibility of a message being delivered to a consumer but not being processed due to a consumer crash. It does, of course, increase message acknowledgement latency. Show you how it works on the slide here. We send a message to a consumer. It processes the message, and once the processing is complete, it acknowledges it. And then finally, the message is acknowledged and removed from the queue. Regardless of acknowledgement mode, unacknowledged messages effectively remain on the queue and will be delivered at some later time to another consumer for processing. With most messaging platforms, by default, message queues are held in memory in order to provide the fastest possible service to producers and consumers. Managing queues in memory has minimal overheads as long as memory is plentiful. It does, however, risk message loss if a server crashes. To guard against message loss, a practice known as data safety, queues can be configured to be persistent. When a message is placed on the queue by a producer, the operation does not complete until the message is written to disk. This scheme is shown here on the slide. Now, if a message broker should fail on reboots, it can recover the queue's contents to the state they existed in before the failure, and no messages will be lost. Many applications simply can't afford to lose messages, and hence persistent queues are necessary to provide data safety and fault tolerance. As I mentioned earlier, message queues deliver each message to exactly one consumer. For many use cases, this is exactly what you want. My online purchase return needs to be consumed just once by the originating vendor, so I get my money back. Let's extend this use case. Assume the online retailer wants to do an analysis of all purchase returns so it can detect vendors who have a high rate of return and then take some remedial action. To implement this, you could simply deliver all purchase return messages to the respective vendor and to a new analysis service. This creates a one-to-many messaging requirement, which is known as a publish-subscribe architecture. In publish-subscribe systems, message queues are known as topics. A topic is basically a message queue that delivers each published message to one or more subscribers, as illustrated here. With Publish Subscribe, you can create highly flexible and dynamic systems. Public publishers are decoupled from subscribers, and the number of subscribers can vary dynamically. This makes the architecture highly extensible, as new subscribers can be added without any changes. It also makes it possible to perform message processing by a number of consumers in parallel, thus enhancing performance. Publish Subscribe does place additional performance burden on the broker. The broker is obliged to deliver each message to all active subscribers. As subscribers will inevitably process and acknowledge messages at different times and different rates, the broker needs to keep messages available until all subscribers have consumed each message. If we only have a single message broker in our system, it's potentially a single point of failure. A system or network failure can cause the broker to be unavailable, making it impossible for the system to operate. And as you know, this is rarely a desirable situation. For these reasons, most message brokers enable logical queues and topics to be physically replicated across multiple brokers, each running on their own hardware. If one broker fails, then producers and consumers can continue to process messages using one of the replicas. This architecture is illustrated here on the slide where we have just one replica. Messages published to the leader in this example are mirrored to a follower and messages consumed from a leader are removed from a follower. With leader follower message replication, the follower is known as a hot standby, basically a replica of the leader that's available if the leader fails. In such a failure scenario, producers and consumers can continue to operate by 
switching over to accessing the follower. This is also called failover. Failover is implemented in client libraries for the message broker and hence occurs transparently to producers and consumers. So that's the basics of the features and capabilities that any messaging system will provide you for your applications. Of course, that's all abstracts. And in the next lesson, I want to look at how a particular message broker, namely RabbitMQ, provides most of the features that I talked about in this lesson. Thanks for watching.